It's no introduction. Um, uh, he's such an amazing, you know, person when it comes to the media. He's so passionate about every subject he picks, whether it's on corruption, on government. He's so fearless. And today I want to find out maybe there are some, is there anything at all that ruffles him, that would unsettle him a little bit? Uh, maybe family, who knows? So stay tuned as we uncover Mr. Kwesi Pratt, so the man behind hot issues. Very good morning to you and welcome as well to New Day. Thank you very much. Um, you look very quiet. Um, are you always like this reserved when you're not on camera because you handle hot issues and it's a very, very hot program. <laughs> when you're not talking, you're quiet. <laughs> but are you naturally as, in, as, a, as a person, are you talkative? I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know? Okay, how do people describe you? Well, people say all kinds of things about me. And I don't know whether they are true or not. <laughs> what do they say? I think that some people think that I'm rather, how do they say, forward. Okay. Which may mean that they think that I'm aggressive. Okay. Or pushful or whatever, you know. But I think that people are different people under different circumstances. All people, you know. Uh, when you're in the office and you're busy and you're trying to get out a story and so on, your attitude is certainly different from when you're with friends and you're telling jokes and so on. So people are different at different times and I suspect that I'm no different. Okay. Do you hang out uh, <coughs> a lot with friends? <coughs> I mean, do you go out? Well, I go out every day. Okay. <laughs> I mean, now. work. You're out now, yes, <laughs> but you're, well, you're, you're <laughs> granted a TV3 interview, but I mean, how's your social life like? I don't make a distinction between social life and any other life. All okay. life is the same. You know, all life is about thinking, it's about talking, it's about having fun. So I enjoy my work and uh, many things happen around my work. Okay. So tell me about this, the, this, this posturing that you have, that like you're saying, there's no difference between even your social life and work life. How did it come to you when you were growing up? I just realized at a certain point that there were so many things that had to be done, you know, and I tried to do everything. At what know. point? I don't know, years ago, I mean, for about maybe 20 years or more. My schedule is like waking up in the morning, at the latest by 4.30 in the morning, usually by 4, and I keep going till about midnight every day. And that has happened for the last 20 years or more, you know. And it's simply that there's a lot to be done. So much to be done that, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, if I had 48 hours a day, perhaps it would still not be sufficient. What do, what do you do in a day? I'm glad you said you, if you had 48 hours. So what do you do in a day? Well, today, <laughs> I woke up at 4 in the morning, sure. got myself ready you know, read a little bit and so on, and then jumped into the car, because I had to be on air at seven o'clock. I finished at seven o'clock and I'm here. Okay. And from here, I'm going to the office and I have to produce a newspaper somehow today. Mm -hmm. And uh, by six o'clock, I'm giving a lecture on, on terrorism and so okay. on. So sometime before six o'clock, I have to prepare, reflect or read or something. And then after six, I probably will go and see a few people mm -hmm. and so on. Um, we are doing a project that I need to work on, you know. But then between the time I get to the office and the time I leave, I'm sure to see at least 50 people you know, who are coming to discuss all kinds of things, coming to discuss problems. Uh, coming with projects that need to be looked at and so on. So that is very busy, you know. There are so many people I can't see during working hours. So I rather see after nine, when I leave the Freedom Center after the lecture, you know, people you have to touch base with and so on. And that continues till about 11. And then after that, I drive home. Okay. You know. So when is me time for Crazy Pratt? When is the me time? The, everyone has a moment where they are by themselves, they reflect. You talked about the fact that when you woke up today, you had to read and, and I'm sure you would continue to read because that's practically your job. So when is the me time where you have that moment where it's just you? And it's just me all the time. Really? Yeah. Oh, you have a family? 
Yes, I have a family. Okay. But that's me. Okay. When you say that's you, what do you mean? It's my life. It's me all the time. I mean, I'm sitting here. It's me. I'm sitting here with you and I'm talking and I'm thinking and I'm reflecting and so on. Okay. Tell me about your I know you have a daughter. Yes, I have a daughter. Mm -hmm. I have a daughter. Um, yeah, I have a daughter and I have two sons. Okay. How is your relationship with them like? Because Excellent. you mentioned, for instance, you mentioned that, I mean, you just talked about your shadow for today. Mm -hmm. And where, where, where do they come in? Because everyone wants to have, you know, oh. that moment where they pull a little bit of daddy here and there. In the course of the day, I'm sure to get a call from my son who is in Brazil. Okay. Maybe one or two calls, sometimes three calls, and we'll chat. Um, I'm likely to get a call from my daughter, and we'll chat. Actually, this morning, I couldn't wake up exactly at four. And my son got up early and woke me up, you okay. know, so we had a little chat and so on. So we are always talking, always together. Talking about what, what do they bring to you as a father? I mean, well, how, how are you open? I mean, for instance, you know, a lot of people have the perception that uh, Ghanaian parenting, we're very conservative. There are things we don't talk to our children about. Are you able to talk to your children about everything? Well, I discuss everything that they raise. So it's up to them to raise the issues. What so. are the things they raise? Many things. Okay. I mean, most of the times they are complaining about what I'm wearing. Oh, okay. You know, or why I haven't eaten or something. And we talk about many things. You know, How about their... About, about their own uh, career. Mm -hmm. You know, what to do and what not to do. My daughter tried to dabble in journalism, television okay. journalism. So we talk about that, you know. Are you for it? Everybody is free to do what they want to do. You know, I'm not going to stand in anybody's way. Everybody is free to do what they want to do. The most important thing is that they do it well. Hmm. Speaking of having the free will to do it well, you grew up in an era where, I mean, the media is, is not as it is today. And you, you suffered for it. And it did not in any way hold you back. In fact, you're more, like you said, forward than ever and very blunt, which makes people uncomfortable. Tell me about that period and what we have now. And the challenge we have even with social media. Just take me back to, you know, growing up and trying to even voice out your opinion. Tell me about that era with, you know, the military. And well, I didn't have any special difficulty. As a matter of fact, I did my first radio program in 1969. And I'd been invited by Mr. Frank Autry, who was then hosting a youth program on GBC. And I had played Gaddafi at the UN mock general assembly. And he saw me and he said, look, you can come to the studio and we can do programs. So I started by reading poems and then oh. it developed and so on, you know. And I always did what I thought I had to do. I mean, sometimes you didn't even reflect, you know, you just did it and so on. And yeah, they thought it was good. So. <laughs> You moved from Uncle Frank's show, and then you did Builders of Tomorrow, and then it went on and on, and, you know, I got into television uh, with Emilia Kromoladama. We hosted In Town, which was a very popular program, and then I had my own programs on television and so on, and it went on and on and on and on, and now I spent a lot of hours doing radio and television, okay. you know, a lot of hours. A lot of my time is on radio and television. I'm going to stop very soon, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll come to why. Um, but, I mean, I'm talking about freedom of expression, I mean, it, it, the media landscape has changed. And now we have the, the challenge of even social media and how to, you know, control well, what... Some of, the things, yes. some of the things that... Hmm, some of the things that today are being propagated on the media yeah. are totally shocking. They couldn't have happened 30 years ago, okay. 20 years ago. I mean, it's, it's clear that many presenters and many journalists no longer pay any attention to the rules, to the laws, and so on. I mean, many times I find people pronouncing others guilty, you know. Before. For example, let me give you one okay. example. The way you make it. Many media houses pronounce will you make guilty, even in the course of the trial. In those days, they would have gone in for contempt straight away. You understand? Straight away. I mean... Premier fashion content, content straight away, you understand? That is my worry. Mm. That is my worry. I mean, 
Well, why, why, do you, why do you think we have come to this point? I think they're no longer interested in maintaining very high standards. I mean, some of the programs that I see on air, they're really frightening. You know, I don't want to discuss any particular program, but there are programs that you see on television which are exceedingly worrying. You know, very worrying. In terms of content, is it is it is it graphical or is it lack of research? What what, what is it that? Well, as for research, who cares about research? <laughs> research? Anything, anything goes. You know, you can bring a guy on on television, you know, and ask him to undress, and it's fine. You understand? What kind of research goes into bringing a guy on, 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 on television and asking him to undress, to lift up his dress and so on and reveal all? No research goes into that. It's cheap sensationalism. But we encourage it. Even in the so-called respectable media, that is encouraged. You understand? The other time I tuned into a television station and there was an advert of a malam. Mm -hmm. And this malam is advertising his products, and it includes juju for making people rich. Mm -hmm. And then he had some juju which he calls for girls, and so on. And it's on television. I mean, who would allow this on television? And some of the religious broadcasts, they are just simply outrageous. I mean, the claims which are made by religious leaders on air. And we tolerate it because they, they pay us money I mean, to keep our stations going and so on. And then the level of ignorance of, 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 of some presenters is, is completely shocking. That's plain ignorance, you know. But even if it were just for the ignorance, maybe we can tolerate that. The ignorance comes with also, you know, the abundance of, of arrogance. People think that once you sit behind the camera, microphone, a microphone, you become the wisest person on earth. We are not. We are now sitting behind microphones now. That's a question of privilege. We are just privileged that we are here. We are not the wisest people in this country. We don't know more than anybody. It's just circumstances which have put you and I together this morning behind, you know. And if you don't realize that, you begin to sound arrogant and you're totally off-putting, you understand? I think there's just simply too much empty, very, very empty noise, you know, in, in the media. Well, what, what can we do then? Do, do, you, do you think, I mean, there's hope? Oh, there's hope. Where, 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 there, there's where, always hope. There's going. always hope. You know, the media houses themselves have a responsibility to take training seriously. I mean, now, you look at a crowd, we have about 40 to 50 newspapers. You have scores of radio stations and television stations and so on. It is not possible to get the best, you know, if all these media outlets have to run and so on. It's not possible to get the best all the time. So whatever you have, you've got to spend some time on training. And I don't understand why media houses are not organizing weekend seminars and schools for their staff. I mean, what would it take to bring a lawyer to, to, to say, TV3 at weekends to take reporters and staff to basic press law two hours every weekend? And that would bring about a lot of change, a lot of improvement and so on, you know. So the media houses themselves ought to take quality serious. It needs resources to run, so it must generate some resources. But in the process of generating that resource, which is vital for its survival and so on, I think it's also important to bear in mind the service that the media renders to society. Okay. And th there's got to be a good balance of the two. Okay. I mean, you've been running uh, the Inside Newspapers since 1993? 1993. 1993. Okay. Uh, well, what, what, is the, what is the agenda of the Inside? What, what is the focus? From the very beginning, we told ourselves that the Inside was not an enterprise for making money, you know, and, and we're very clear about our objectives. I mean, look, if we want to increase the circulation of the inside, it's so easy. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Put a few naked pictures on the front page, and you're there. 30,000 copies, 50,000 copies, and so on. I mean, all the newspapers which used to do 50,000 copies, what were they publishing? Rumor? Huh? 
naked pictures and so on. It's so easy to do that. What we want to do is to give expression to views and positions which have no expression in the media. And that's why we are that's, so different. That's, that's, that's big. Views and expressions that have no views. That have no place in the regular media. That have no place in the regular media. In the regular media. And if you look at the inside, it's so unique. It's so different from any other newspaper. You understand? When all newspapers are doing the battles in the NPP and Afoko and so on, we are doing the Songun Lagoon. You understand? Songun Lagoon doesn't sell copies. You can't sell too many copies, but we think that it's important for us, you know. And I think that over the years, we've come to earn some respectability. Everybody knows that we are not sensational. I mean, everybody who is watching the media knows that um, there are certain things that we would not publish. And so on. And I'm happy with that, you know. That is why we established the insight, and I'm happy that we are achieving that. Uh, you, 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 you believe that the, the, the trend of, I want to remember the institution that mentioned, you know, did a research that you know, the media focus about 70% of it to political issues, and it's plastered all over the newspapers, and, you know, the developmental issues, whether it's something on agri, cocoa, they are in the middle of the corners that you don't, but those are the things that drive development. So you, you, do, do you think that, you know, the, with plastering all of that, it's a, uh, we are driving the path to destruction? But we believe in being passionately political. Passionately political. Because we don't think that there's anything negative about politics. I mean, politics essentially is about um, how resources are produced and how they are distributed and so on. So everything falls under the rubric of, of, of politics. And we do not shy away from politics at all. In fact, we are in it. And, and we believe that that is where we ought to be. You understand? What the problem is with politics is the partisanship, the unhealthy partisanship. I mean, to the extent that everything must be put in a pigeonhole. You know, whatever you say, whatever you do, whatever you see, whatever you hear, ought to be either NPP or NDC and so on. That is where the problem is, you know. But otherwise, politics is a very healthy enterprise because it's about our development. It's about production and it's about the sharing of what is produced. Okay. Let me pick your, your thoughts on uh, the developments in uh, the NPP. And you know how they held the Red Friday, um, accusing government and the like, and you know it keeps happening and, and all that. I have heard Dr. Kosiini say that I mean the posturing of political parties, not just the NPP and the NDC, it's dangerous for us as we go into 2016 elections. I want to get your, your own views on well, that. Well, I read the views of Dr. Kosiini, yes. and I fully agree with him. You know, I fully agree with him. I mean, one of the points he makes is that uh, when political parties win power. Then the electoral register is no longer a problem. The conduct of the electoral commission is perfect and so on. But when they lose power, then everything is wrong. You understand? I think that attitude ought to change. Hmm. Do people? Okay, no, go ahead. Finish. Yeah, things are wrong because they are wrong. Uh, and, and they are wrong because they are not good and so on. They are not wrong because they happen to affect the opponent or affect us in a certain way. You understand? And I fully agree with Dr. Amy. Okay, I, I I know you are in Nkrumah. You still you do, you distribute some copies of books to the Muslim, the Kwame Nkrumah Muslim, to about two thousand of them. What, when you say you are in I I want to get it from you. What, what do you mean by you are in Nkrumah? What does that mean? It means that you accept the paradigm of development that Nkrumah put forward. You understand. It means that you believe that Africans are not inferior to any other race and that Africans can do what every other race has done and perhaps even do better. Yes, sir. When you say that you are an Nkrumah, it means that you believe that the resources of Africa, indeed the resources of any part of the world, can be managed by the people themselves and in their own interest. When you say that you are an Nkrumah, it means that you have a certain commitment to the equitable distribution of the world's resources and so on. These are the tenets of Nkrumahism. Okay. Do you, do you, are people accuse you of speaking for government? Mm -hmm. Do you speak for government? They also accuse me of speaking for the opposition. I mean, it's not new. I mean, look, I was very, very active in putting together the Alliance for Change. 
it was made up largely of NPP elements and opposition elements and so on. Was that wrong? Hmm? I was very, very active in forging what came to be known as the Great Alliance between the Convention People's Party and the New Patriotic Party. Former President Kufo himself has said on many occasions that I played a great part in, 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 in making sure that he became President of Ghana. Was there something wrong with that? When former President Rawlings was being harassed and so on, I, I stood up in his defense. Was there something wrong with that? I thought that President Mills was a very decent Ghanaian with a passion for the development of Ghana and so on. And I said it. What is wrong with that? There are things that this administration has done which are very good. If I say it, what is wrong with that? Only yesterday, I was raising a storm about the, the, the utility tariffs. Yes. You know, what is wrong with that? I don't care. I mean, people can, can decide to put me in any category that they wish. That's their business. That's not mine. You understand? What? Is it a crime to be MPP? It's not. Is it a crime to be NDC? It's not. Is it a crime to be CPP? It's not. So why should I worry about whether people think I'm NBC or NPP or CPP and so on? It's, it's absolutely immaterial. Well, what is important is what? The values? What is important is what we are all contributing, you understand? To make sure that the people of Ghana can realize their full potential, their full human potential. That's the key. That is what is important. You understand? What is important is whether we are true to the principles that we claim guide us. Hmm? What is important is whether or not hmm, we engage in a battle against underdevelopment. Okay. So these are the important things. So what principles do you work with? What are, what are the principles that guide you? If you're, if you're, like, like you said, if, you're, if, if, if it's on uh, an issue, let's say, if, you, if you're, uh, uh, whether it's a tariffs you're talking about, if you, it's wrong, it's wrong. But what values do you work with? What principles do you work with as an individual? As well, a citizen of Ghana? first and foremost, that the world we live in today is not God-given. And that this world can change. First of all, I'm not, I'm not happy at all with the conditions in which all of us live in. Yeah. And who can be satisfied? I mean, this morning, I read the story of a four-year-old child who needs some treatment. You know, he has a problem with his uh, esophagus or esophagus or whatever it is. And he needs 15,000 cities to undergo surgery. The family doesn't have 15,000 cities. Can you believe it? that in this world, there's a four-year-old child somewhere in Kumasi who needs 15,000 cities to survive and it's not available? Can anybody be happy with this condition? Nobody can be happy with this condition. This is Ghana. Hmm? which is bordered to the south by the Atlantic Ocean, which has many rivers crisscrossing its land and so on, and yet it's important fish. Who can be happy with this situation? Who can be happy with the situation in which elements of the IS are slitting throats in Syria just because some people don't want the legitimate government of Syria to continue? Who can be happy with the situation in Iraq? Well, over the last five years or so, more than a million people have been killed. And who can be happy with the situation in which, in spite of the enormous resources available to mankind, hmm, people are still dying out of malaria. Okay. So I believe very, very passionately that this world can change and that we can have a better world if all of us will work at it. You understand? We are told, for example, that the world has enough resources mm, to cater for the needs of about 50 billion people. Mm. Today's world's population is around 7 billion, and yet we have hunger, we have poverty, we have lack of access to, to portable water and so on. It's clearly unacceptable. And if you look at why the world is where it is today, then you can understand the movement which is emerging in the United States of America, the 99% movement, you know. Why? You take the resources of the United States of America. Hmm? 
and about 2% of the population of the United States of America controls 98% of the resources of that country. Yeah. It's clearly unacceptable. Yeah. You know, clearly unacceptable. You know, we have gold, we have diamond, we have manganese, we live in the tropics, we have rivers, we have brilliant human beings like you. So it's a problem of so, uh, mis mismanagement. <laughs> it's not a problem of mismanagement. It's not a problem of mismanagement. It's a problem of the fundamental structure of society. Okay. The fundamental structure of society. And if you're talking about the fundamental structure of society, you look at Ghana again, we produce cocoa. You don't determine the prices at which cocoa is bought. It's determined by cartels in the West. Mm -hmm. We produce gold. We don't determine the prices. When we import tractors, machinery, medicines, and so on, we also do not determine the prices. This structure of the world puts us at a permanent disadvantage. You understand? Okay. When we export, we lose. So this when is we import, what drives we lose. what you do. This is the reason for our underdevelopment. Okay. You know. The other day I was listening to Dr. Gamel Nasser of the Modern Languages Department of the University of Ghana. And he said that for every dollar that comes into the Ghanaian economy from the so-called donor communities and so on, seven dollars is taken out. This lopsided you know, situation is responsible for underdevelopment. And it can change. It can change. We must change it. We have no option than to struggle to change it. Okay. Um, Mr. Kwesi-Frant, uh, you did uh, the bare facts. Yeah. You hosted bare facts and then hot issues. And they are issues, they are programs that you, know, you confront your guests pretty much with the facts that you have. Um, how do you select your guests for the shows, one? And do they tell you you make them uncomfortable? First of all, I don't select the guests. The, the that's what the, that, that's the, what the production team to do. Occasionally, you will make a suggestion, okay. so, but basically, it's the production team that does that. But there have been situations where people have been invited, and they've walked into the studio without knowing that I'm going to host them. <laughs> and they see me in the studio, and they don't want to do the interview anymore. They want to go away. Why? Because they feel uncomfortable with me. Why are they uncomfortable with you? I think it's a certain myth. That? Oh. <laughs> There's a huge myth, you know, that uh, you've got to get your facts right to confront somebody like me. And so, you know, I mean, and there, have been, there have been occasions where I've interviewed people, and at the end of the interview, they are so relieved I and mean, so happy that the interview went the way it did because they expected some confrontation, they expected to be embarrassed, and then they sit through the interview and it doesn't happen. And they are so, so very, very happy, you know. And then there are times, um, some of the producers that I've worked with that you know will tell you, the guy comes into the studio, he's actually shaking and so on. So what you do is that you stabilize him first before you do the interview. You make him feel comfortable, you know, by relaxing him or her and so on. And we do that all the time. But do you intentionally go out there to make them uncomfortable? What, or what, what do you think? What is, what is it about... Uh, you or the subject that you're treating mm -hmm. that makes them uncomfortable? Well, some of them, it would appear, may not be very honest. And they may be afraid that their dishonesty will show. You know, that's possible. Some of them may think, and, and it's a complex of inferiority, may think that they don't know their subjects that well. And that if they come up against a presenter or an interviewer who appears to know his or her stuff, then they will get exposed. You so there, there are many reasons why people feel uncomfortable with all kinds of presenters and so on. Okay. As a matter of fact, a lot more people want to go into a studio and just have a conversation about mundane things, you know, pedestrian issues and so on, and blow their top and walk away. Very, very few people want to have very serious interviews. And I'm sure you're aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
w who is a fa your favorite person that you've interviewed? Who's a, I mean, a per an interview that whether went well or the favorite person you interviewed? Who do you, do you remember? Because you've interviewed so many. Yeah, there are so many of them that it's, it's very difficult to, to pinpoint one that is exceptional and so on. But there are few. There are few. Okay. I mean, I did an interview with the uh, former president of La Côte d'Ivoire, Laurent Babu. And his brilliance was, was, was exceptional. I mean, his, his level of confidence, you know. There's a president who walked into the interview without wanting to find out what we were going to ask. He just walked into the, the interview and spoke freely and so on. But uh, most people who are obvious who want to know the subjects. Exactly. And it makes me so uncomfortable because okay. I'm not reading a script. And when I'm interviewing people, I'm not reading a script. It's the first question which is important. All the other questions flow from what your guest says. You know. So when you want to interview somebody and they're asking for a list of questions, <laughs> I don't know how to give them a list of questions because it won't follow any laid down pattern and so okay. on. You know. mm -hmm. But Laurent was, Babo was, was, was fantastic. He was, he was exceptional. Was it because he was on top of the subject or uh, he just, like you said, I mean, he didn't care, he wasn't worried. Is it because he was just on top of it or he was honest? I think he was honest and confident. Okay. Honest and confident, you know. The other interview which I did, which I thought was really fantastic, unfortunately, also happens to be another president. <laughs> you know, President Abdul Aziz, Aziz. Okay. of uh, the Saudi Arab Democratic Republic. Okay. You know, I mean, he is still he is still in the struggle. I mean, his country is not yet fully liberated. So I went to the liberated zone, I and mean, I spent some time with the guerrilla fighters and so on. And then I sought an interview with him, you know. And I was just ushered into his presence and bam, we did the interview. And it was, it was a very good interview, okay. uh, exceptional interview. What is the problem in Ghana? You appear on programs, you know, uh, I mean, Kokoko, is it? It's Kokoko, mm. and you, I mean, and other programs as well on radio. And like, and you make statements, I mean, you critique the issues. And so people know that, okay, this is what you think about the issue. Mm -hmm. And that is also could be another reason why they wouldn't want you to interview them. That is true. You're right. Absolutely right. Okay. But th does that in any way also influence you in terms of what you, you say? Or you are always liberal and you will say it as it is, regardless of who? Uh, no, when I'm interviewing somebody, I'm not out to make the person accept my viewpoint. I'm out to, to make it possible for the person to express himself or herself. Really. That's all. So my views don't matter. You understand? What I think doesn't matter. You understand? Any, any interviewer knows that if you're interviewing somebody, it's not about you and what you think. It's about making the person, the target of your interview, express themselves fully for the audience to make a decision about what they're saying and so on. So I don't go out of my way to push my views. In fact, if I was to do that, I would become quite repugnant, you know, to many people. Okay. Because my views are not ordinary views. Okay. But some have also accused you of insulting them, that you insult them. I never them. insult. I never. When, when you say Moses Zanza, you're born or are born. <laughs> I've never said that. <laughs> you didn't say that no. on Kokoko. How did you say? I don't, I don't even remember. You don't remember on, on the on, on <laughs> you don't you don't remember. No, I don't remember. So nobody has session. ever accused you. Oh, there was one time when we were going to interview a very big man for hot issues, yeah. and then we got to his house and he said, "Look, you have been insulting me, and therefore I'm not going to grant you an interview." And I said, "What was the insult?" And then he couldn't say it in the presence of everybody. It was so bad for him that he couldn't say it in the presence of everybody. So it turned the media, out the same media that reports it, or is, what's the, okay. it turned out that what he was complaining about, I mean, there's a big guy in academia and so on, who had written a book. Hmm? He had written a book. Now, we happened to find another book, authored by a Japanese, hmm? which is word for word. <laughs> you understand? Yes. Word for word. Paragraph for paragraph, and so on. <laughs> that, that's funny. And there's a Ghanaian professor who claims that he has authored a book. So what did we do? We took this Ghanaian professor's work, published it on one side, and published okay. the Japanese work on the other side. That's funny. And asked our readers to tell. He thinks this is an insult. You've exposed him. But it's not an insult. That is our work. 
It's not an insult. You understand? So a lot of times people say that you've insulted me. And really what they're saying is that you've made them uncomfortable. Or you've exposed their weakness. Or you've made them look irrational in the eyes of the public and so on. Is that an insult? It's not. Okay. All right, welcome back. We're here with uh, Mr. Kwesi Pratt, Jr., managing his editor and Insight newspaper and presenter, Hot Issues. Uh, I mean, we can't leave the show without talking about the National Media Commission. And you are a member of the National Media Commission. And uh, I mean, the criticism, extensive criticism against the commission is that, um, what's the word they use? That is a toothless bulldog. Are we harsh on the National Media Commission or how can we make it Bite. Well, I haven't started work yet. yet I just okay. took my oath uh, last week. But if you read the Constitution very clearly, the National Media Commission was not supposed to get teeth. It's not a biting organization. You understand? It's not a court. It doesn't, it doesn't impose punishment and so on. The National Media Commission essentially, its primary responsibility is to ins insulate the state-owned media from governmental control, mm -hmm. and also to regulate the practice of the media. So I understand that one of the things which is currently being done is that it's drawing up guidelines for religious broadcasts. And I think it's very important. Okay. Some of the things that pass for religious broadcasts are, are, are troublesome, you understand? I mean, there's this famous picture of the man of God, you know, stamping on the on stomach a of a pregnant woman, woman yeah. and so on. We allow that, you know, the claims that they make, I mean, people are sick, they go to hospital, and then the pastors tell them on air that they should throw their medicines away, you know, and, and fast, and so on. Yeah. Are these acceptable things, you know? And it's not just about the Christian pastors and so on. I mean, Muslims die. And somehow they are convinced that uh, we need not carry out uh, post-mortem examinations on the body because they have to be buried before sunset and so on. Now that's a danger for society because you don't know what killed them. And what killed them may affect many other people and so on. So we need to find out and so on. But on the basis of some religious conviction and so on, these things happen. I think we need to examine all of that. You know. mm. So, uh, I, I mean, I have more questions, but unfortunately Absolutely, we don't have a lot yeah. of time. I don't know if you have a question for him, because I, I wanted to ask about, you know, where you know, we're supposed to advertise alcohol at certain yeah, times. Exactly. And, and the media, we're flouting it, mm -hmm. and we still continue I, to do it. We I should would find them millions of dollars. More interested in the mm -hmm. media commission getting, having the teeth to bite and sanctioning when they need to be, mm -hmm. because then... Yeah, there, there are other institutions for doing that. Can the do courts that. are still there. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and the courts can deal with cases of libel, defamation, and so okay. on. And where there have been criminal negligence, the courts are there to deal with that. The media commission is not supposed to be a court. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I'm sure there is more we can uh, get from Percy Pratt Jr. But he, 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 he's, you know, he's still like he mentioned, he's still you yeah, very calm. Um, <laughs> are you known? Have you been told that uh, one of your popular things is masa, 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 masa. Yes, masa, yes. Masa, masa. Masa. <laughs> masa. Where did that come from? Masa, masa, masa. No, I grew up in. Uh, <laughs> places like Kutuwabi down, so okay. that's uh, well, a lot of arguments and discussion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But there's <laughs> also to say that, like, your line, no, I don't agree with you. No, master, 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 master. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for coming. He doesn't do a lot of personality, you can tell when you ask him personal questions, you know, he gives you very, very close answers.